Pulperum. The Pulperum is the period following labor. It is characterized by the following features. The generative organs return to their pre-gravid state. Lactation is initiated. Then recuperation from the physical, hormonal and emotional experience of the parturition takes place. Preparing begins as soon as the placenta is expelled and lasts for six to eight weeks. This process involves the generative of organs to return to their pre-gravid state known as involution. Okay, so that's one thing about uh, preparing. At this point, the, all the organs that we are involved in pregnancy, birth and all that will begin to return to their non-pregnant state. Like we said, during this period, involution of the uterus begins okay the uterus will return back to its uh, non uh, pregnant state and the uterus now leaves the abdominal cavity to return to the pelvic cavity where it belongs okay then another thing that is known about this uh preparum is that there is lotion okay and locha is a term given to the discharge from the uterus during the preparum. They have a reaction in which organisms flourish more readily than in the acidic vaginal secretion. So the amount of locha varies in different women and is rather more in quantity than what is lost during the menstrual flow. The odor is heavy and unpleasant but not offensive. We have about three types of lochia. We have the lochia rubra. This one occurs from one to four days for the first three days and uh, mostly and consists mainly of blood. Okay, they also contain streets of dysuria and fragments of crime, amniotic fluid, lanugo, venous, casosa, and Myconium may also be present. Also, another lochia is lochia serosa, which uh, tends to come after the mother from five day, fifth day to the ninth day. The discharge is paler and brownish in color, containing less blood and more serum, as well as leukocytes and organisms. Another type of uh, Lucia is Lucia Ava. Lucia Ava. This discharge tends to flow as from 10th day to the 15th day. That is last from 10 days to 15 days. Okay. But the discharge is creamy greenish in color and contains leukocytes. Okay. And organisms and cervical mucus and debris from the healing process in the uterus. And vagina. Slight blood discoloration may be seen for as long as three weeks it might persist. Okay, but however, if the locha persists and it continues to be red, reddish, that is decaying blood, is a warning sign that product of conception may have been retained in the uterus and of the likelihood of severe prepara hemorrhage occurring and therefore it is important that uh, the woman should report for full assessment because there is danger of retained products of conception several factors can slow involution during preparing prolonged labor use of anesthesia and excessive analgesia difficult birth, a full bladder, incomplete absorption of all placenta things that can slow this process from occurring. Complications that can be encountered during preparing. Okay. 
One is postpartum hemorrhage, which is defined as blood loss greater than 500 mil. The following warning signs should be easily identified. Failure of the uterus to contract following delivery of the placenta and maternal collapse. So these are the warning signs that possibility of uh, postpartum hemorrhage may have occurred. That is failure of the uterus to contract and um, following delivery and maternal collapse. Okay. The, we have um, secondary postpartum hemorrhage. Secondary postpartum hemorrhage is defined as fresh bleeding from the genital tract between 24 hours, that a full day, and six weeks after delivery. Women with returned product of conception will be having crampy low abdominal pain and a uterus larger than the appropriate. Okay, so in this uh, postpartum hemorrhage, which we say a bleeding greater than 500 mil, it can be primary that the one that occurred less than 24 hours after birth, uh, uh, which presents with failure of the uh, uterus to contract and maternal collapse. We say that is postpartum hemorrhage. That immediately after the, the baby has been delivered, then the bleeding begins is postpartum hemorrhage. Then we also have secondary secondary postpartum hemorrhage, uh, the bleeding that began after 24 hours of birth to six weeks. And we see the cause of that one is as a result of a uh, returned product of conception. And this presents with low abdominal pain that is crampy and a uterus larger than the appropriate. Management of secondary postpartum hemorrhage or primary postpartum hemorrhage one uterine compression and rub that is why in the first stage of labor we say in the first two hours continue to rub the uh the maternal abdomen at least every 15 minutes okay so this is to rule and help prevent immediate postpartum hemorrhage okay so the uterus will contract Okay, so the management said uterine compressions and rub, then IV line, 400 units of oxytocin in 100 ml saline over 4 hours, then 800 to 1000 misoprostol. So these are the drug of to control the bleeding immediately. Okay, once it is postpartum hemorrhage and not intrapartum, maybe from uterine ruptures. So you carry out uterine massage and rub you said iv line and give about 40 units of oxytocin in 100 ml of uh, normal saline to be infused over four hours and then 800 to 1000 misoprostol okay the other condition that can occur during postpartum is mastitis which means inflammation of the breast however this inflammation is not always due to infection okay mastitis is commonly related to breastfeeding problems and occurs when a blood dot obstructs the flow of milk and distends the alveoli if this pressure persists the milk spills into the prelobular tissue initiating an inflammatory process the affected segment of the breast is now painful and appears red and odimatous. The woman also experiences a flu-like symptom such as tachycardia and pyrrhizia. The most common infective organism is Staphylococcus aureus, which is found in 40% of women with mastitis. Other bacteria include coagulase negative Staphylococcus and Streptococcus viridine. Early localized mastitis can be managed with massage of the breast towards the nipple and pain relief. If the mastitis worsens, then a sample of the milk should be taken for microbiological culture and fluclosacillin commenced while awaiting 
sensitivity results. Breastfeeding should be continued during this process. About 8% of women with mastitis develop a breast abscess and treatment is usually surgical incision of the abscess. What are the clinical features of mastitis? A lump and then soreness. Then a red tender area that is painful with fever, tiredness, muscle aches and pains. Okay. So these are the clinical features of uh, mastitis. I'm trying to say that mastitis occurs. So we're trying to explain that mastitis occur uh, necessarily we can say uh, due to microorganisms, but also may not be as a result of microorganisms. Microorganisms like, like the staphylococcus, like, like, like we said, can cause it. Also, when the mother is not breastfeeding or having challenges in breastfeeding, it can also lead to mastitis. A situation whereby the duct uh, is blocked, maybe due to the milk not going up. The milk will keep uh, flowing that way, and from there they can move to, uh, to the other tissue initiating an inflammatory process. So now that one is mastitis due to a uh, blockage of the dot of flow of milk, uh, which has led to distension of the alveoli and the milk spilling over to peri of uh, uh, lobular tissue initiating an inflammatory process. Also, the uh, errors also are found to be the cause in about 40% of women. So we are not entirely said that mastitis as a result of these microorganisms. That blockage of the flow of milk can also be the cause of these mastitis. I will say that the clinical features include a lump. You feel a lump, then soreness, area that is reddened and painful in the breast. Okay, the uh, heat. Uh, Okay, the feeling of pains, sorry, and uh, tiredness and other flu-like symptoms, aches might also appear in that. Treatment is usually symptomatic. So, antibiotics, resolution without progression to an abscess will usually be prevented by antibiotics, so that flu saline 500 milligram four times daily for five days. Uh, and sometimes if it is severe, can, you can give it up to 10 days. Okay, if the woman reacts to uh, fluoxacillin, then uh, cephalazine 500 mg four times daily for at least five days is recommended. Then you also give the woman perilip, so ibuprofen and prastamol, provided none is contraindicated. Then you also have to instruct the woman on the following to keep the affected breast well drained so that the milk will not continue to build or pile up there because the, those microorganisms started acting on those milk that is uh, uh, being stored in that periobular area then continue breastfeeding okay do frequently and start with the sore side first okay they should continue to breastfeed then most times she can apply heat okay in that area like hot showers or hot face washers okay cool the breast after feeding using a cold uh face washer from the freezer and apply cold something on that area then empty the breast well and or carry out hand express of the milk if necessary now another complication due postpartum is breast abscess and we said that breast abscess can result when this uh, duct is blocked and the milk uh, moves from the uh, the lobules to the periobular tissues and uh, the acting of microorganism on it leads to abscess abscess development and this presents with tenderness redness beyond 48 hours and the area of induration develops okay so also antibiotics is used to treat it. Then another condition is breast engorgement. Engorgement of the breast usually begins by the second or third 
postpartum day. And if breastfeeding has not been effectively established, the overdistended and engorged breast can be very uncomfortable. Breast engorgement results in a preparer fever of up to 39 degrees Celsius in around about 15% of women. Although the fever rarely lasts more than 16 hours, other effective causes must be excluded too. That is, if a woman has fever, you also have to rule out other causes before you say it is entirely breast engorgement because it only happens in a fraction of 15% of women. So you should, uh, you should rule out other possible causes of fever in the postpartum. A number of remedies for the treatment of breast engorgement includes manner expression of the breast milk, firm support, okay, ice bags, and electric breast pumps. Okay, then another complication that can happen during uh, postpartum includes painful nipples. Nipples become very sensitive during the late pregnancy. And in the first week of breastfeeding, sensitive nipples can cause a whole lot of discomfort during the first minute of breastfeeding, but it settles spontaneously. Painful nipples, however, occur after the first week of feeding and worsen during feeding. A common cause of this is cracked nipple, like a kind of fissures in the nipple. And this is associated with an increased risk of breaks abscess because if that cracked nipple staphylococcus aureus inverts it it can lead to abscess formation you know that uh, staphylococcus lives on the skin and is the chief cause of anything concerning abscess is the staphylococcus aureus that is responsible for it so once it's entered that nipple it can lead to abscess formation okay and the cause of uh, painful nipples is usually poor position of the baby on the breast Although candidiasis may also cause soreness, okay, the treatment is to correct the underlying problem, but may also require local antibiotics ointment, analgesia, or even resting the affected nipple. Okay, then another complication is blood stained nipple discharge. Blood stained nipple discharge uh, during pregnancy is typically. Uh, bilateral and it is believed to be due to epithelial proliferation it usually occurs in late pregnancy or early breastfeeding and lasts for up to one week as the condition is self-limiting no investigation or treatment is necessary and the woman should be reassured okay so that is um blood stain nipple discharge okay so these are likely and most common conditions you might likely see in postpartum.